Hey everybody, John Schumacher here with NewWaveHealthcare.com and just want to give you guys a quick reminder, we are a video podcast, so if you're listening to this on iTunes or Stitcher Radio, please go over to NewWaveHealthcare.com if you're interested in viewing these wonderful interviews via video content. If you like looking at the video format like I do, check it out there, NewWaveHealthcare.com and we also link up all of our guest contact information underneath the videos on the show notes page. So if you hear a guest that inspires you, you want to learn more about their product or service, go over to newwavehealthcare.com to get all of those resources. Subscribe to our email list. Uh, we put out a weekly uh, newsletter with all kinds of awesome tips and tricks on the healthcare innovation, healthcare marketing space. So if you're an innovator or a startup interested in healthcare innovation, check us out there. Subscribe to our email list. I also want to announce that my partner Michael Bloom and I are officially launching our consultancy business. So we have been, myself and him have been online for several years now, have learned a few of the tips and tricks and have spent hundreds of hours and thousands of dollars um, kind of learning from gurus and things like that. So if you have a healthcare small business and you're interested in, in checking us out, seeing how we might be able to serve you better, uh, go ahead and email me at john, that's J-O-N, john at newwavehealthcare.com. We offer a free consultation service and we'd be happy to just talk with you and see if we could be of service. All right, well let's get started with the interview today. Today my guest is Dr. Chris Russell, who is the founder and chief medical officer of NoteSwift. Dr. Russell is a practicing neurologist and a software developer, so he's a bit of a, a double threat there. Uh, he was compelled to start NoteSwift in 2008 because people couldn't read his writing and he simply got sick and tired of clicking on the mouse a hundred thousand times a day as a doctor, driving him nuts. So he said, forget it, I'm going to start my own company out of, <laughs> around this problem. Took action in 2008, launched NoteSwift. Um, he, so NoteSwift, in, in kind of a, a brief synopsis, is, is sort of a bridge between an EHR and the Dragon voice recognition software. Dr. Russell will get into that more as we go forward here. So. Dr. Russell, thanks for coming on and, and chatting with us today. Let's just start off by having you share a little bit about you personally, and then we'll jump into your business. All right, thanks a lot, John. Uh, I started as a software engineer back in the 1980s with a, a computer science degree. Uh, had no real inkling of going to medical school and became interested in medicine through uh, MRI, back when MRI was new, I did some, some software research and then um, went to medical school and, and went into practice uh, as a neurologist. I've been in practice now for 16 years. Uh, about 10 years ago, uh, we got an EHR, so we were toward the early adopters of EHR. And uh, although it, it did a lot of wonderful things, I immediately became acutely aware of uh, the problem of documenting patient visits. That It took longer than it used to when I used to dictate into a cassette recorder and I would hand it to someone to transcribe and they would type it and, and put it on a piece of paper. Um, there were a lot of downsides to that, but uh, from a productivity standpoint, it was actually pretty quick for me. Uh, so uh, it, there were all the wonderful things about the EHR, but uh, it, the, the difficulty of putting together the note was one of the downsides for me. And, and that's kind of where I decided, hey, maybe I can blend together my two uh, my two professions, basically, to, to try to solve this problem. Right, right. So you blend it together. You, you were, I mean, would you say, I mean, the EHR, obviously, probably it was taking more time, right, with all the clicks and everything like that than it was the old transcribe and print kind of method. Yeah, that, absolutely. Uh, and it would take sometimes twice as long to do a note. And I became very adept to using the EHR pretty quickly. So I don't think I was slow with it. I think I was uh, probably about as fast as anybody. Uh, and still found that I couldn't get things done as fast. Uh, specifically, couldn't get my notes done as quickly as I used to be able to do uh, with uh, traditional transcription and, and even pen and paper. Um, and uh, so felt that I needed to do something about that. The first thing I did was to get uh, Dragon uh, uh, Medical, and that helped to solve some of the problem, a little bit of it, at least generating things like narrative text. But all of the discrete data fields, uh, the pretty much 80% of your, your patient document uh, was still didn't fit well with Dragon. Okay, right, right. So so you saw a problem in the market and took action on that. So um, so boil it down for our listeners who want to get like a snippet of what you guys are really doing at, at NoteSwift and, and hit us with your elevator pitch, if you will. Like, what do you guys at NoteSwift do? 
Yeah, what we do is we're the bridge between the EHR and, and Dragon Medical Practice Edition. We use uh, speech recognition to enter data into the EHR as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Uh, our goal is uh, to be a productivity tool. We reduce the time that it takes the physician to generate the patient uh, uh, visit note, plain and simple. So we're there to improve the physician's productivity, allowing them to spend more time with the patient and spend less time in the EHR. Our goal is to get rid of navigation as much as we can. You know, uh, uh, when I looked at it more closely, uh, what we found was that uh, a lot of the time that was being spent was either spent on navigation, uh, that is point and click with a mouse, or typing into search boxes to find uh, you know, some content that was there. Uh, with uh, NoteSwift, you can get rid of both of those. Uh, you can, rather than uh, you know, clicking on some box and having to type and search into it, you can just say what you want. Uh, so we're not just about changing navigation to voice navigation, we're really about eliminating navigation so that when the doctor's talking, they're always saying relevant information. They're not having to worry about moving around through the EHR. Okay, so they can spend less time typing on their computer during visits and more time with, with the actual patient and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, so what makes you NoteSwift unique in the marketplace? I mean, are there other companies that are providing the similar service? Are you guys kind of the pioneers of that genre of service, or, or what does that look like? Well, I think we're really the pioneer. You know, Dragon Medical Practice Edition has been around for a long time, but we're the first people uh, to take speech recognition and really tightly integrate it into the EHR, uh, where you can use uh, speech uh, to get all your information in as fast as possible. Uh, and that is every component of the patient visit, not just the narrative text, not just the things you need to search for, but really start to finish where the doctor can pick up a microphone or use your desk mic, start dictating, rarely touch the mouse, never touch the keyboard, not have to issue a lot of voice navigation commands, and, and they can be finished. Uh, I don't think you'll find any other product out there like that. All right. Okay. And so the time difference is huge. I mean, what is the typical time for an EHR? on like a standard system versus your system? Well, if you look at just using Dragon and an EHR by itself, for instance, a new patient visit might take anywhere between 10 to 20 minutes to document uh, based upon how much uh, information is in, uh, is in that patient's uh, file. Um, for us, we can generate that in three to five minutes. Uh, and we've done extensive timing tests to compare uh, against us versus just clicking in the EHR. Uh, our product versus using Dragon standalone, and so it really is a substantial difference. So you guys are saving these companies big money then with, with an, that much of a difference in speed and efficiency. I mean, how, how much on average are you, I mean, do you mind saying that, or I mean, how much are you guys saving these companies? Well, well, it varies. For, for it, you're, we're primarily helping the doctor. Uh, you know, it can be 30 minutes, it can be longer than that a day. It depends on the patient mix that the physician has, but uh, we think 30 minutes uh, is toward the, the, the low end as far as uh, the productivity that we save them. Okay. All right. So so you obviously saw this as a problem, got sick of it, and took action on that. So was that was that your aha moment, or can you kind of describe when you said, you know what, I've had it with a stupid mouse, I've had it with all of these things, like I, I'm going to start, start a company around this problem. Can you talk about kind of that moment? Yeah, it, the aha moment really was... Uh, you know, realizing that you actually could put these two products together, that you could take the EHR and that you could take uh, Dragon Medical and that you could merge them together. You know, I think everyone, when they get Dragon Medical, the idea in their head is that, that it should handle everything, that you should just talk and the information is going to go into the EHR. And it does that to some degree, but to really get it where it needs to be in every possible circumstance, it's got to be very tightly integrated. So it was a realization that, okay, it, I have in my mind this idea of what this should be, kind of, kind of the ultimate way that it should work. Uh, and then it took a look around at what Dragon was capable of and said, you know, this, I can make this happen. And that was kind of the aha moment of it. It was more, uh, I think, the, the, the vision that pretty much every physician has of what should happen uh, and realizing that it actually would work. Right, and you had a, a kind of a, a different background in that you were a software person, and you and so you're like you, you know the reference points of like what it might take from a technical standpoint, but then having a medical background and bringing those two together, would probably popped it right out as as you know what this is something that can easily or maybe not easily but can be done. Right, is that kind of what it, if 
felt like. So, so you so you had this moment, and then you, how, what did you do after that? How did you get the ball rolling uh, with Note Swift? What were some of the first steps you had to take to make this aha moment become a real a reality? Well, the first step, even before the business got started, was to build it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course, being a full-time physician, uh, I just had a little bit of time to do that. And um, with the realization that, hey, even if this doesn't sell one unit uh, in the future, <laughs> I'm going to benefit from it. <laughs> you know, so I, I had the advantage that that I, you know, even if I even if I never sold the product, I was not going to be disappointed. Um, so I, you know, I just built it bit by bit and put it together, and uh, had the advantage that when. Uh, we started a company and got funding that the product uh, for at least one EHR was already built, uh, it was already tested at least by me and, and had been used uh, in the field. So really the, the in, in our case the product uh, came first and then the company came second. Right, you gotta, they always say to scratch your own itch, right? If you're, if you're thinking of starting something or creating a problem. That, that, that's perfect, uh, yes. Look at your own life, right? Look at your own problems because you know that they're real problems. You can't sometimes, as as an entrepreneur or an innovator, you're you're trying to guess at what the problem might be. But when you scratch your own itch, like like Dr. Russell did here, I mean, he he saw a problem, had this had the vision to take a look at it, and and then took action on it. So scratch your own itch. I think that's a good way to put it. So so you made the product, and then you did what with it after that? You, you created it, you tested all the bugs and the betas and all that. Did you have a bunch of people try it with you, like beta test it for you, or what was the we, next we step? Had a few. There, there really were not too many. You know, I think uh, I did a lot of the testing using, you know, different environments, different operating systems, uh, you know, really trying to mix it up as much as I could as far as being thorough on the testing and, and took it to market to just a select group of people, you know, just uh, almost... I wouldn't say door by door, but almost like that, to, to have some people try it out and use it. Got a little bit more field experience uh, with it at that point uh, before we decided to, to build it to a larger company. Right, right. So how did you know that, that people would accept it? I mean, you just took it to your friends and, and or people that you knew, and they, they liked it. They gave it the thumbs up. So that what inspired you or, or said, okay, this is valid. This solves a problem. People are willing to use this. Is that kind of how it worked? Yeah, that was a little bit of it, although I have to say some of our earlier adopters were not people that I knew. I, we just decided, okay, uh, this is ready to be sold. It's been tested uh, both uh, making sure that it works, number one, and, and number two, making sure that it's relevant to the physician, and, and then just put it out there on a small scale and, and started uh, selling small numbers of units uh, and really found that uh, almost all of our customers liked it right out of the box. They uh, took it for what it was worth and, and went with it. You know, it really when the physician sees it, it's easy for them to see the value. So, uh, you know, they, and it, like I said, it, they already have in their mind how they think speech recognition should work. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you show this to them and basically they're seeing how they think it should work uh, in their mind. So, so you're really kind of fulfilling some need that they know that they already have. So was there any, any resistance to using it at all by the doctors or were you, were they, was it pretty smooth no. as far as the transition? A few resisted primarily because they didn't feel comfortable with the speech recognition, with the Dragon product, wondering how well is it going to work. Uh, that was really uh, our biggest obstacle. And what we found is that if you go into a practice, about half the physicians are, are either using Dragon or they're very willing to start using it. And so you have to make sure that you hit that particular group. Right, right, okay. So, I mean, how did you, you, you said you slowly kind of scaled it out in the beginning. So did you just... How did you find your first few doctors to try it? Did you just have them in your existing network? Uh, we uh, went uh, to our Allscripts, who uh, our product worked for uh, for our first EHR, which was Allscripts Professional, and went to uh, some of their sales force, uh, some of their uh, regional managers, and said, hey, we'd like to get this out to uh, a few of your customers, and they were uh, very uh, helpful in putting us in contact with some folks. Okay. Perfect. And then, so you, did you? How did you record the feedback? You just did you message them, or how did you get that information back? Well, initially, uh, we were uh, myself was involved with uh, training them uh, from the get go using WebEx, uh, doing the installation, you know, checking up on how they were doing after the first few weeks. So, uh, you know, I was a developer and, and uh, the product designer, and also got the feedback. Uh, from the physicians who were using it in the field and handling all the support. So, you know, at the beginning I really was, you know, handling all of the technical aspects from, from designing, building, uh, testing, uh, training, 
uh, and support side. Uh, and so it, that, that's a lot of work, but you're able to feed back into the system very quickly when you're able to do that. So when you find a support problem, let's say that is going to influence your design or your product development, you know, when you're the guy doing it all, it's very easy to integrate that uh, back into the product. Uh, so uh, even though there weren't a huge number of people using it at first, it was able to get very good feedback and make quick product changes. Okay. So then once you validated that, that it was going to be a good product and, and used, I mean, how did you scale it out from there? Well, at that point, uh, we went to uh, venture capital, uh, to okay. angel investors, and, and that kind of, you know, kind of changes the landscape quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Right, sure. Yeah, definitely. Huh? So, um, I mean, how did you find angels? I mean, did you just... Did you have an Indiegogo campaign, or did you just simply go out and, and have contacts that you went really, through? Really through networking, uh, yeah. through uh, you know, talking with uh, physicians who were familiar with the product, uh, who knew other people, and then they knew other people. And uh, you know, it helps to have somebody who's using it or, or sees the value in it as a physician, uh, and then them getting to their uh, investor network. Uh, so it really, was, it really was word of mouth and, and you know, kind of second, third degree contacts that made it happen for us. Right, right. Yep, there's no, no substitute for having an awesome group of people in your network, and certainly was the case there. So um, what was the biggest challenge during this process? Like, you know, you've taken this, you started small, kind of scaled it out, and then, you know, be able to get funding and then really blow it up now. So, I mean... What were some of the biggest challenges along that journey? Well, before getting the funding, really just the, the cycle of, of getting the funding. You know, it takes a little longer than you uh, expect. You know, you have to be, uh, you know, honest about your company and you have to, uh, and with yourself about it, and uh, have to put together a lot of documentation. I mean, you got you got to put together a business plan, something that I think companies don't have, at least at, at the level that we were at. And... Uh, you have to shop that around a little bit, you know, uh, when you're uh, starting getting venture capital, you know, uh, the people, uh, the venture capitalists, of course, have a lot more experience with the process than you do. Uh, and so you want to make sure that you're, that you're working with folks that you trust uh, yeah. and uh, make sure that you're going through the process correctly and, and have people help you out with that who know a little bit more about it than you do. Right, right. So uh, can you can you briefly touch on that process? Like what was, how did you get started getting venture capital and then how did it go from there? Well, uh, you know, I, through networking, we, we talked to a, a few different people and um, hit a, really just upon one uh, who was very interested in the product and, and who had a great reputation, Blue Stem Capital out of uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, and uh, spent our time with them. Uh, and uh, they wanted to make sure that they understood the product uh, very well, understood what the market was for the product, uh, how we were going to be able to get into that marketplace, uh, how much it was going to cost, uh, and um, uh, basically took that step by step uh, until we uh, until we reached an agreement. How did you find the, the metrics to share with them? Um, it, a lot of that actually is well published. You know, some of the things we wanted to look at is what is the size of your potential market. So for us, that's the number of uh, healthcare providers who are office-based in, in the United States, which is around 750,000 if you include uh, mid-level practitioners as well as uh, physicians. Uh, what percent of them are using an EHR? What percent of them are, are using speech recognition? What are some of the projections of change in, in that particular market? Uh, and then realizing that, you know, you're not going to, the hardest part, of course, uh, is uh, uh, making some prediction on what part of that market you're going to be able to get. Mm -hmm. um, and, and basically showing that, you know, if my product is successful, if I can capture a reasonable amount of the marketplace, not some pie in the sky percentage of the marketplace, but just a reasonable uh, part of the marketplace, that that's a very successful business. Mm -hmm. And did you, did you find these, these metrics like on just a website somewhere or how did you? How did uh, you know? In various places, so largely on the internet. Yeah. Um, you know, the government publishes a lot of information about number of physicians in the U.S., uh, and, and now, especially with meaningful use, you can find out, you know, which EHRs uh, are being used most uh, commonly. Uh, and some market research, primarily along, you know, the percentage of EHRs uh, that are being utilized by physicians. Um, but in large part, public information. Okay. All right. Well, so you got all those materials, you got funded. That obviously helped accelerate your business. And then as it comes to, to today more, like how are, how are you guys 
marketing your services? I know one of my passions is online marketing, but I mean, can you talk about how you guys are getting the word out now about NoteSwift? Yeah, absolutely, and, and we do it in a few different ways. One uh, thing that we came to understand very quickly was uh, that uh, you can't just it's very you can't just direct market on the internet to physicians uh, and okay. to, uh, healthcare providers. They're they're a difficult group to get a hold of, and you can't reach them through the traditional uh, consumer uh, internet channels. You know things like uh, Facebook or, or advertising or uh, you know or or just having them browse to your website. Uh, a few people do that, but you need to reach them through other uh, channels, and, and that means through uh, the people who are working with them on the EHR, the people who are working with them uh, through sp the speech recognition training. Uh, there's a, a very uh, robust uh, support network out there for physicians and EHRs. Uh, there are a lot of people who do uh, custom EHR uh, training, who do customization within EHRs, people who sell Dragon, who do Dragon training. Uh, and they have the ear of the customer, so uh, we do it through a really a primarily an indirect uh, model, working through them. Uh, we found also that trade shows, uh, especially that the customers attend, has been very beneficial for us. Right, right. So, so you mentioned these physician support networks. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Like for somebody who doesn't isn't familiar with that as much, um, are you talking about you know networks or companies that are? Uh, what exactly do you mean by that? Well, they're small companies uh, or sometimes even single individuals uh, who help to support the physicians once they get an EHR. Uh, this is beyond, let's say, the EHR company. So if somebody has an Allscripts EHR, of course, Allscripts is in the mix, but they're generally going to have you know, a person who's uh, potentially in-house, more commonly a contractor, who's going to help them uh, set up their system, uh, customize their system, make changes. Pretty much all EHRs, when they're installed, uh, work better if it's customized for that particular practice, and, and there are people out there who, who do that. And uh, it's a lot easier to reach that group. It's a smaller group of people than you know the 750,000 providers who are out there. Okay, so you basically try to almost jo create a joint venture or some kind of partnership with these sense. organizations. It's a partnership, and, and they can resell and do the training as well, which is beneficial to them. Right, so, so you don't feel like you can really, with your product, say, reach physicians through, say, like LinkedIn or something like that that's a little more professional than, say, Facebook and stuff where probably a lot of doctors aren't really hanging out much. We can reach them a little bit through LinkedIn, although right now, even on LinkedIn, physicians are really not all that active. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, LinkedIn is a better uh, modality than something like Facebook is. Okay. Yeah, so, um, okay, well, um, can you kind of talk about, I know before this, this conversation, or before this interview, we talked a little bit about how you guys are using webinars to help educate potential clients, and, and you're getting traffic to these webinars, and then you're probably offering some kind of maybe trial or something like that. Can you touch on kind of that whole funnel process of how you use webinars to, you know, attract clients? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we do it in a couple of different ways. Um, we will do custom demos uh, on the web. Uh, using uh, web webinar products uh, that are in existence, and this is uh, where, let's say, a practice wants to see a demo of the product. Uh, that is by far the most common scenario that comes up, and so that's something that we'll put together just a, on a you know a one-on-one -on -one basis with that particular practice. And I've done dozens, if not hundreds, of those. Uh, and then we do uh, webinars as well using uh, products like GoToWebinar and, and WebEx, um, and um, we do schedule those ahead of time and, and get word out to specific people who may want to see it, uh, you know, and uh, building a database of uh, people um, is uh, very important as well, that you can get word out uh, to them uh, that there's going to be a webinar happening. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, how do you get traffic to these things? I mean, again, is that through your partnerships or is that you're not doing anything through you know, advertising on, you know, LinkedIn or these media sites, are you? Uh, no, we're not. A lot of it is through partnerships, and in fact, that's where, that's where we get most of it. Uh, we also get direct contacts, uh, which arise, some from our website and, and some from attending trade shows. Okay. All right, so you guys do capture traffic from your site, and some of those people do attend and, and, and then eventually become clients, possibly. Yeah, that's right, and and the EHRs help us a whole lot along those lines too, uh, and uh, getting information uh, from them, working with them to to get the word out on the webinar. 
Okay. So what kind of offer do you guys give at the end of the webinar? Do you guys just offer a trial or, or just the full service? Uh, it, we we want to typically uh, contact with either us uh, or with uh, one of our resellers or with our uh, EHR partner. Um, okay. All right. Well, Chris, um, as we kind of wrap things up here, let's just have you give uh, give our listeners one parting piece of advice, uh, and then tell us where we can find out a little more about you, and then we'll say goodbye. Yeah, absolutely. A, a parting word of advice uh, would be. You know, work to make yourself productive uh, in, in the healthcare uh, IT field. Uh, productivity, I think, is is where it's at. There's a lot about uh, you know regulatory issues. There's a you know a lot about uh, broadening services. But something that can make the physician and the office staff more productive uh, is really uh, the the most important thing that you can do. I think to be successful in the healthcare IT field. Um, you know, I, we've put together a great team. Uh, from uh, the medical community uh, and from Nuance. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I've uh, had to do as the founder of the company, uh, I still work full time as a physician, is to kind of step back and hand it over to people who are really very experienced. You know, uh, a lot of times when you have a startup, you have people who uh, have a tremendous amount of energy, a tremendous amount of, of work ethic and intelligence. Uh, but but are maybe a little lacking on experience, and the, the group that we have is is just tremendously experienced, uh, both in the healthcare IT field and in the speech recognition community. And so, you, you have to feel comfortable, I think, uh, as you grow your company, handing over the, the a lot of the reins uh, to other people. There you go. Yeah. And where can our viewers find out a little bit more about you? They can find out more uh, on, at noteswift.com uh, is our website, and uh, all of our contact information uh, is there. Uh, you can email us at info at noteswift.com, and we're on uh, Twitter at noteswift as well. Perfect, perfect. All right, everybody. Well, thank you, thank you, Dr. Russell, for coming on and, and sharing your company and some of your strategies and thoughts on, on the industry and, and how you guys are doing things at NoteSwift. Uh, we appreciate your time today. Great, John. Thanks. All right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed that discussion. Uh, we'll have a replay up. You can go over to newwavehealthcare.com forward slash note swift to view the replay of this video interview as well as the audio, and we'll also link up all of, of, of Dr. Russell's contact information below the archive page there. So head on over and check that out there, and uh, that's it for now. I'll see you on the next one.